Okay, so let's talk a little bit about changes in potential energy, because this is really where this stuff um, is going to be important. If we have, like we talked about before, a satellite, and I want to <clears throat> stick this satellite up into space, how much work is going to be required to get it there? Or if I, for example, have something falling from space, like a meteorite, and it's going to crash into the Earth, well, how, much, how fast might it be traveling when it reaches the surface? So this is all going to be um, related to changes in potential energy. So we know that a change in anything is final minus initial. But just make a note here of what happens when I sub in my values. Final potential energy is going to equal negative g m1 m2 over r final. And I'm going to subtract from that negative g m1 m2 over r initial. Well, these negatives here kind of cancel out, don't they? And so I could, I could rewrite this whole thing as g m1 m2 over r initial minus g m1 m2 over r final which looks really weird because we probably just spent the last year and a half convincing you that a change in anything is always final minus initial but when it comes to potential energy it sort of looks like initial minus final and that's just because there was a negative sign out front the whole time now this can be simplified again because i don't want to punch all that into my calculator that's too much work i could call this g m1 m2 and take out a common factor of g m1 m2 and what I'd be left with is 1 over r initial minus 1 over r final. And I just want to point out that this, it is really tempting to think that this is the same thing G, as this, g m1 m2 over r initial minus r final. And I want to point out that this is a giant no-no. That is not the same thing. You need to take the inverse of the initial and the inverse of the final and then subtract them and then you can work them into the GMM values over there. So, how much work is required to move a 4,500 kilogram Earth satellite from an orbital radius of 1.8 uh, times 10 to the 7 meters to a radius of 4.2 times 10 to the 7? Now, in this case here, how much work? Um, we're going to just focus on potential energy. You could make the case that if I'm changing the orbital radius, I'm also changing the speed and so on. But let's assume that we're going to move it out to a higher orbital radius and we're just wondering about the work we're going to do against our potential energy. So work equals a change in potential energy is going to equal G M1 M2 times 1 over R initial minus 1 over R final. And so this equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 times 4500 and I multiply that by 1 over the initial which is 1 over 1 1.8 times 10 to the 7 minus 1 over 4.2 times 10 to the 7. Now <clears throat> before we just go ahead and solve this uh, in our calculator we should have a sense of what's going to happen here. So I started with a, with a satellite that was a certain distance away my initial and I move this further away. So I wanted to move it out to this point right here to a greater R final. So what you should have a clear sense of, it'll be hard to know what the answer would be, but you should have an idea of whether you're expecting a positive or a negative answer. Because when your calculator spits out the answer, um, that's the only thing about it that you should be definitely 100% sure of before it gives it to you. And so we can see here that if I'm gonna go further away, <clears throat> I'm expecting that I should end up with a positive answer here. This should be positive work. I'm gonna to have to work against gravity. I'm gonna put energy into this system if I wanna move this satellite. So this whole mess here that I'm gonna punch into my calculator right now, that had better come out as a positive or I know that I've done something wrong, okay? So I got 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, and then I'm gonna multiply that by 5.98 times 10 to the 24, and multiply that by 4,500. And then I'm gonna multiply it by, in close brackets here, so I'm gonna do this like this. I'm gonna call this 1.8 to the power of seven, and then I'm gonna take that whole thing and hit it with a to the negative one. And so basically this, 1.8 times 10 to the power of seven, all to the negative one is the same thing as the inverse of that number. So those are the same, minus 4.2, times 10 to the 7, again, all to the negative 1. And when I close my bracket and hit enter, 
what do you know, I get a positive number about 5.7 times 10 to the 10. And so while it is difficult to know if that's the correct amount of energy, it's a hard number to just know off the top of your head, the fact that I got a positive answer is really reassuring because really, uh, if I'm lifting this farther from the earth, I would definitely expect to be putting work into the system, not getting work out. Okay, so one more example here and then one more thing. All right, so uh, the International Space Station does this, and this is a real thing. They drop waste shuttles on us every once in a while, which is a fun trick. And so if they have, um, if they're up there at an altitude of, uh, let's see, 3.5 times 10 to the 5 meters, so about 350 kilometers up, and they, if they were to drop a waste, uh, a waste shuttle down on top of us, how fast would it be traveling when it hits the surface, assuming there's no air friction? Luckily, these little poop shuttles, they burn up in the atmosphere, which I don't know if that's better or worse, but I'm going to say it's better. And um, yeah, let's take a look at this. It's really important that we recognize what our R initial and our R final values are. So this distance from there to there is um, 3.50 times 10 to the 5. The radius of the Earth is my R final value, which is 6.38 times 10 to the 6. My R initial value is this entire thing. So R initial is going to be 3.5 times 10 to the 5 plus 6.38 times 10 to the 6. So that's going to be 6. Point, let's see, 6.73 times 10 to the 6. And so now I can calculate my uh, potential energy with uh, the formula that we our brand new fancy formula, our change in potential energy is going to equal g m1 m2 times 1 over r initial minus 1 over r final. And when I plug in my values here, again, this is getting to be familiar, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24. The shuttle is 250 and then one over my initial, which is 6.73 times 10 to the six, minus one over 6.38 times 10 to the six. And I'm just running out of room. I just squeeze it in there. Now, again, before you punch in your calculator, just uh, have a think about what you expect your answer to be. If an object is falling down towards the earth, I'm expecting that it's going to be losing potential energy as it falls and it would fall faster and faster gaining kinetic energy as a result. So I'm expecting this to come out as a negative number. And so when we punch it all in our calculator we get negative 8.13 times 10 to the 8 joules. Um, and so this isn't quite the full story because what we're trying to find out is um, the speed it's going to hit the ground at. And what we now know is how much potential energy it lost. Well, that'll be a kind of a short jump with our conservation of energy to get there. I just want to point out that um, with conservation of energy, you're probably, or I'm guessing you're used to this statement right here, which is basically saying that our initial energy equals our final energy. Well, this statement is the exact same thing as saying our total change in energy is equal to zero. If your final equals your initial, then your total change is zero. Well, if we're talking about our total change in energy, then that would equal our change in kinetic energy plus our change in potential energy. And so this leads us to another form of our conservation of energy equation, which I'm going to use here, which is to say that my change in kinetic energy is just equal to a negative change in potential energy. And hopefully that kind of makes sense. It's basically just saying that whatever amount of energy, potential energy we lost, we must have gained an equal amount of kinetic energy. So when I sub in this number here, negative times negative 8.13 times 10 to the 8 joules, you can see that I have exactly this much, the positive value, uh, is the amount of kinetic energy that I end up with. So remembering, of course, that our um, kinetic energy, that if our, if our kinetic energy initial is zero, then our change in kinetic energy would just be 1 half mv final squared. And so v final would just equal the square root of 2 ek over m, which is 2 times this number again, all divided by 250, and uh, don't forget to take the square root of the whole thing there. 
So I've got 2 times 8.13 times, oh, 2 times 8.13 times 10 to the 8 divided by 250 is going to be that number. And then I'm going to get uh, the square root of my answer. And I get 2,550. So 2,550 meters per second. So it's just as well that thing burns up the atmosphere. I don't think that'd be a lot of fun if that hit us. So I'm going to skip this example here, although it's something you could you could try uh, yourselves on your own because the last thing I want to talk about is about escape velocity. So as you know, what goes up must come down. And that's true unless, of course, you throw it really, really hard. And that is to say that if you give something enough kinetic energy, then it can completely break free of the Earth's gravitational field. So escape velocity, this idea of escape velocity is, okay, what's the minimum speed that an object would need to break free of the gravitational pull of whatever planet it's on, okay? And so it should stand to reason if an object is going to be completely freed from Earth's gravitational pull, well, you need to supply it with enough kinetic energy to match its potential energy at infinity. And so basically what this means is if you are starting here on the Earth, if you're starting on the Earth with a satellite and you want that satellite to completely break free, then you need this satellite to be able to make it to where R equals infinity. And remember, where R equals infinity, your potential energy will equal zero. So that's our line of potential energy equals zero. So we're starting with some initial potential energy, but your final potential energy has to add, uh, end up at zero. Well, at the same time, you're gonna to have to give this a whole bunch of kinetic energy. So you're gonna give it a kinetic energy, which is gonna allow it to reach infinity. Now, if we're talking about the minimum amount of energy required, you're, you're just barely gonna break free of Earth's pull. This is a really weird way to say it, but basically, you wanna give it just enough kinetic energy that it comes to a, a stop when it reaches infinity, whatever infinity means. So what I'm saying is the minimum energy would be such that the kinetic energy final would also be zero. So you give it the kinetic energy it needs to match its initial potential energy. And so basically the initial kinetic energy has to just be the opposite of the uh, initial potential energy. And so if we sub in our values here of one half mv squared, that has to equal negative negative g m m over r, we can see that the mass of the satellite or the thing, whatever it is you're trying to send into space, doesn't actually matter. And when we solve for velocity, the velocity is going to equal 2 g m divided by r square root. And so this is our escape velocity. You note that that's different from the velocity required to stay in orbit, for example, which we've already looked at. So at what speed do you need to throw a rock in order to, for it to leave the Earth's gravitational pull? Well, to completely break free of Earth's gravitational pull, the escape velocity would have to equal root 2gm over r, which would be 2 times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, multiplied by the mass of the Earth times 10 to the 24, all divided by, in this case, the initial radius of the Earth, 6.38 times 10 to the 6. And we take the square root of this whole thing here. So 2 times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 divided by 6.38 times 10 to the 6 and then I need to square root that whole thing. And my answer is 1.1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. About 1.1 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. And so the last question here asks, does the mass of the rock matter? No, somewhat surprisingly. Although, of course, the energy it takes to get that rock to the speed required does depend on its mass. So maybe that's something to consider. All right, that was a really long final notes, but you are officially done uh, gravity and circular motion.